Hello and welcome to Biostatistics in a Nutshell. My name is Pascal and I'm going to be your statistics guide for the next six weeks or so. What you can expect from this online course is a series of pre-recorded lectures as well as the opportunity to interact with the course instructors, that's myself and Paul Corey, once a week uh, for six weeks and you will receive um, a schedule via email. Okay, so who are your course instructors? Well, I've already introduced myself, Pascal, and now let me introduce you to my wingman, uh, Paul Corey. Now, Paul Corey has been teaching statistics at the University of Toronto for many, many years. And actually, it was Paul Corey who taught me my introductory statistics at U of T when I was doing my graduate work. Okay, let's start off with a little fun. So Benjamin Disraeli uh, was a very successful prime minister of England in the late 1800s, and he said, there are three kinds of lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. Now this perception of statistics, um, it comes from the fact that um, if you torture uh, data enough, um, you can get it to tell you basically whatever you would like to say. Um, and so it's our job as statisticians uh, to make sure that the way we report findings and the way we perform our statistics um, are done correctly and with integrity. Now here's another fun one. So Andrew Lang was a, a poet, a Scottish poet actually, um, and he says he uses statistics as a drunken man uses lampposts for support rather than for illumination. And I think this one uh, points to um, those of you that think that statistics is just a chore that needs to be done um, and something that uh, you, you think of at the very end of the project. Oh yeah, whoops, I gotta put some statistics in here so I can get published. Rather than thinking, well, actually, if I consider statistics all through the process of uh, research, so meaning from beginning to end, that I may actually uh, come out with a much better product as opposed to just uh, as a crutch. Okay, so who recognizes this British lady from the late 1800s? Probably not too many people have read, you know, raised their hand. However, uh, if I tell you it's Florence Nightingale, I'm sure most of you are gonna say, wow, that is the founder of modern day nursing, and you'd be right. However, what you probably don't know is that she also contributed a lot to the field of statistics. And she did so by incorporating um, management and administration of resources uh, in hospitals, field hospitals, and, and basically in medicine. And this is how um, she built uh, modern day nursing. Okay. Uh, here's her wonderful quote. Statistics, the most important science in the whole world, for upon it depends the practical application of every other science and of every art. The one science essential to all political and social administration, all education, all organization based on experience, for it only gives results of our experience. So there you have it. Florence Nightingale, a statistician. Who knew? Okay, let's play a game. So Paul Corey has been playing this game with his students uh, at the University of Toronto for many years. And essentially what it involves is you flipping a coin four times and then repeating this a billion times. You then calculate the proportion of the billion games that has two heads and two tails. Now, of course, in the past, uh, Paul would do this in class, of course, and hand out slips of paper with the five possible answers, and you would circle the one that you think is correct. In this case, uh, we're virtual, and so we're just gonna ask you to think of the correct answer and hang on to it in your head as we go through the slides. Um, I'm going to give you um, exactly one minute to think about it, and uh, then we'll move on to the next slide. So. Ready, set, go.
Okay, so that's 30 seconds. You have another 30 seconds to go. What proportion of the billion games has two heads and two tails? Each trial is flipping a coin four times and recording the number of heads and the number of tails. Okay, time's up. Put your pencils down. I'm just kidding. Just think of the answer, hang on to it, and I'll see you in the next slide. Okay, welcome back. So if you answered 0 0.4, you would be correct. Now, interestingly, this is a sample of um, some of Paul's results from uh, numerous classes taken over time. And you can see that the most popular result is 0 0.5, by far and away. And this is then followed by 0 0.2, and then 0 0.3 and 0 0.4 is about the same, and then finally 0 0.1 is the least popular uh, answer. And so what we're going to go over now is how did we come to an answer of 0 0.4 in terms of proportion of equal heads and tails. Okay, so every time you flip a coin, you record whether or not you have a tail or a head. And you do this four times for each trial. So these trials are going to look like these groupings of four letters, uh, or four letters, four T's or H's. And each one represents a trial. And if you did it a billion times, you'll see that a lot of the trials look exactly the same because they're the same result. And it so happens that if you sort them all, you'll see that there's only 16 possible ways of flipping a coin four times. And then if you order them in the number of heads per trial that you get, you'll see that you'll go from zero heads, so all tails, one head, two heads, three heads, and then four heads where you have no tails. Interestingly, what we're interested in is the middle column where you have two heads and two tails, and this is where you have the greatest number of possibilities or possible ways of flipping a coin four times. You actually have six. And if you look at the number of ways you can get two heads and two tails over the total possible ways of flipping a coin four times, that's 6 over 16, which is 0 0.375. And if you round that up, it's 0 0.4. And there is your answer for the proportion um, of your flips, of your trials, that will have two heads and two tails if you had done it a billion times. If you didn't get the, the answer right, don't beat yourself up over it as most people, as we've seen anyway, um, through the years, most people uh, guess wrong anyway. Okay, what's next? Okay, what's next is a little funny. So here's a, an old cartoon, and I say old, but it's, you know, it's not that long ago, it's in the 90s, uh, but it's, it's actually a, a scan of a, of a, of a newspaper uh, comic strip, uh, which you know these days uh, you say you see extremely rarely, if if at all. Anyway, so the born loser. Anyway, so the the uh, the teacher says, you know, can you tell me how much four plus five is? And the little girl answers eight, and uh, the teacher says, no, uh, four plus five equals nine. And and she says, then let's try again. How much is six plus three? Ten? No, six plus three equals nine. And then the uh, little girl says, wait a minute, I thought you said four plus five was nine. So what's going on in this car comic strip is that the little girl did not know that there was more than one way of getting a sum of two numbers that's equal to nine. And in our game, many students did not know the number of ways of getting two heads and two tails in four tosses of a fair coin. So before 
introducing an important application of this coin flipping result, um, let's introduce the general statistical model. Suppose we want to compare patients on two different drugs, diets, or exercise programs. Call these exposures. We have N patients in each group. How did they get assigned into groups? Now, one way is to select the data from a database in what is called an observational study. You guys should all be well versed in that. And the other way, subjects did not choose the exposure, but were randomly allocated to the two groups by the scientist in what is called a randomized trial. Okay, before you freak out when looking at this slide, thinking to yourself, whoa, I did not sign up in, for this course to have this kind of math on slides. Um, let me explain something to you. So we're teaching you introduction to statistics. Inevitably, there is math and statistics. Therefore, we need to include some math in our teaching uh, just so that we can, you know, back up uh, all the concepts that we're sharing with you. But what our expectation is uh, for you is simply to listen, try and understand as best you can, and then to have on hand all of these slides as a reference so that you can come back to it later if you wish and do the math and go, oh, I get it, you know, fantastic, now I understand, um, as a tool, as an aid for you as you move along in um, your statistics education. Okay, so this slide here, we're introducing the concept of a random variable, essentially. And so that concept is, is you know, obviously very important in, in math and in statistics, but essentially it's, it's every variable uh, that you want to include in your model will be a random variable. So meaning that even if you were to, let's say, consider body weight, you're going to uh, be drawing um, body weights from a population of body weights, right? And so if you wanted to then, you know, predict, or if you wanted to know what the probability is of drawing a certain body weight from the population, you would need to know the distribution of body weight across the population. Makes sense, correct? So in this one, because we did coin flipping, we are working with a binomial distribution. And we showed this in the previous slide where we had we ended up having a, a frequency distribution of 16 possible um, trials uh, for when we, we flipped a coin four times and the, the, the coin was fair, meaning that there was a 50% probability of getting a heads or a tails. And this is what we're showing here in the math, that if you want to know the probability of, um, here, let me get my pointer going for you, the probability of drawing two heads or two heads, two head, uh, or two tails, of course, um, from a trial that has four flips in B, which is the binomial distribution, then this is the math to calculate the probability which we did in the previous slide, which is 0 0.375. In this case, this is combination, the combination of when you have uh, four flips and you want two heads. This is the probability, P, uh, of obtaining um, a head here. Q is the uh, basically, it's 1 minus P, uh, which is the probability of obtaining tails. In this case, they are equal, of course, because it's a fair coin. Um, this uh, nomenclature uh, is explained here. It's factorial, and it's simply 4 factorial is 4 times 3 four times 2 times 1. I'm sure you guys have covered that. And so when you do the math, this is how you come to the calculation. If you wish in the future 
to actually handwrite all of the possible uh, results that can be obtained and do as we did in, in the previous slide, you certainly can do that. The challenge, of course, is if you get a, a very large distribution with very many different uh, results, it will take you a long time. So this, uh, obviously, this concept can also, for instance, be applied to the trial if it wasn't a, a flip of a coin, but a homozygous offspring, uh, you know, in this case, it's recessive, AA, for the heterozygous parents uh, where you have uh, the dominant allele and the recessive allele. If you have this cross, what's the probability of the homozygous offspring, recessive, uh, will be P equals 0.25, and, and you're welcome to, to give that a go um, in the equation above. Now this slide should look familiar to you because we've already shown you the same information but in a different format. So this is the binomial probability distribution for when you have uh, four trials, so four uh, flips of a coin um, with a fair uh, probability of obtaining heads or tails on the flip. And on your y-axis, you have the binomial probability. And on the x-axis, uh, you have the proportion of heads. So this looks exactly like the previous slide, you know, two, three slides ago, where you um, sorted and, and ordered all of the possible results from your four flip uh, trials. Uh, and essentially here we've just put it into a graph and we've put the little bars to represent, for instance, where you have uh, two tails, two heads uh, right in the middle. You'll see that um, the probability on your y-axis is 0 0.375. Nothing new. This is just showing you um, how you would represent it. Okay, so what's different in this graph? It's extremely similar. As you can see, the y-axis hasn't changed. The x-axis hasn't changed. But what has changed is the bars that represent um, the number of heads ha have fattened. <laughs> have increased in size. And what this is uh, insinuating is that we've gone from uh, a discrete um, distribution, so in the sense that you're, you have counts that are um, represented for each bar. Uh, and here, in, and that was in the previous uh, slide, and in, the, in this slide, we are showing areas for each um, bar. And so this is an important result because what we're showing is that probabilities can be areas under a histogram. So why is this important? So this is important because for us to be able to um, consider an area um, as opposed to counts allows us a little more flexibility in terms of um, being able to predict or what's called expectation. So meaning that depending on a distribution of your random variable, you need, you want as a statistician, the ability to estimate um, a probability, a given probability of obtaining um, a certain outcome. And to do that, you need the ability to use a function uh, in order to calculate that, which we've just shown in the, you know two slides ago. And so the ability uh, for us to use math to do it is what's going to give us the ability in statistics to make these estimations. So in this case, it's really handy that the total area under the histogram or under the Gaussian or normal probability curve is equal to one. And this is, uh, for us, uh, kind of the, um, the start to introducing you to the idea of, of expectation uh, in statistics 